So then he says, the same thing must be going on everywhere in nature. And that's chapter two of the origin, variation in nature. That's a subject that fascinated Rosemary Grant of Princeton as a child. She uh, grew up in a village in the Lake District and at the age of four she used to follow the old family gardener around and she noticed that in any row of vegetables not, no two were exactly alike. And all the trees around their house, the birches, the oaks, the beeches, they were all different one from the next. She knew she had her favorite trees. All of the people in the village, everybody was different, all those variations. And Darwin made a special study of variation in barnacles, and he spent years on it. Uh, so many years that a son of his grew up taking it for granted that every father <laughs> studied barnacles. And uh, he went over to his friend's house once, and he got a tour of the house, and he said to his friend, and where does your father do his barnacles? <laughs> <laughs> So variation, it's inherited, it's in every garden plot, it's in every forest around the garden plot, it's on every desert island. And then think of the pressure out there. That's chapter three, struggle for existence. That's what makes variation so significant, so charged with significance for, for Darwin in his argument. If animals and plants vary, the slightest difference, as Darwin writes in The Origin, the smallest grain in the balance in the long run must tell on which death shall fall and who shall survive. So there, you know, he's talking about the deer that can run a little faster than the other deer, the wolf that can run a little faster than the other wolves, and those deer. Uh, anybody know the old joke about uh, the camp and the bear? Uh, campers and a bear here a deer, a beer uh, a, sorry a bear approaching <laughs> be nice if they heard a beer approaching <laughs> but it's a bear they hear a bear and uh, one of them starts putting on his running shoes and uh, the other one says are you crazy you can't un outrun a bear and he says I don't have to outrun the bear I just have to outrun you <laughs> <laughs> so there are situations Darwin says where the slightest variation is going to become a matter of life and death. Darwin himself couldn't see that happening, but he argued that it had to happen, that it was only logical to assume that it happened and happened everywhere. And he writes, what applies to one animal will apply throughout time to all animals, that is, if they vary, for otherwise natural selection can do nothing. So again, given the assumption of variation, it's only logical to conclude that there will be times, given the pressure of the struggle for existence, the struggle to get enough food, the struggle to stay warm through the night, the struggle to find a mate in our time, uh, among our kind, if we are fortunate, we're much less aware often of the struggle for existence. We're still aware just as keenly as ever of the struggle to find a mate Selection pressure of one kind or another is intense. And in the wild or among domestic species and among our own species, it operates in every generation and individual variations, slight variations, can make all of the difference in whether you pass on your genes or you don't get to pass on your genes. So that's Darwin's argument as simple as that in the origin of species. That's the essence of it. But in his gradualistic view of geological change and of evolutionary change, it all takes place at the level that mountains are built, that rivers wear away canyons. It's all too slow to watch. And that's how most of us still think of evolution today, I think. Certainly, that's how I thought of evolution when I first heard about Peter and Rosemary's work, which is why I was so surprised. And I have to say, from the moment I heard that they go to the Galapagos and watch this, I was so enthralled that, again, I got completely caught up in telling people the story and continually forgot how controversial a story 
It is. And I still remember the first time that happened that I got sort of a wake-up call about the controversy was at a family dinner table, as a matter of fact. It was a, a party in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, my family lived in Allentown at the time. And I was talking at the table about this wonderful new story that I was going to write a book about, the study of evolution in action. And afterwards, someone came up to me by the coat closet at the end of the party and said, excuse me, did I hear you say you were writing about evolution? And I said, yeah. And she said, are you for it or against it? <laughs> <laughs> And then a week later, I was uh, in the dentist's chair, and I was uh, getting my teeth cleaned. And uh, the dental hygienist, who was wearing one of those hygienic masks, uh, and so was a little bit forbidding, but spoke through the mask and asked me, uh, what are you working on now? Did you find a new subject to write about? Uh, and I said, yeah, evolution. <laughs> and she bends really close to me and she stares at me eyeballs to eyeballs and she said, well, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, so you know what I think about that. And I didn't feel I was in any position to argue. <laughs> and then I was finishing the book about the Grants, uh, The Beak of the Finch. I was finishing the book. I'd written the last chapter. I had pulled an all-nighter not as uh, earth-shattering as Alfred Sturtevant's All-Nighter, but I was very proud of the results. I had a chapter, my last chapter, called God and the Galapagos, as a matter of fact, trapped in my computer, and uh, my computer froze. A technical glitch. The computer froze, I couldn't print it out. I had to print out that chapter in time for the Federal, e Federal Express drop-off. We didn't have email. This is early 1990s. I had to get it to the FedEx drop-off in my small town in Pennsylvania, and um, I couldn't print it out. So I called the local Apple store. By the way, talk about the importance of small variations. I hope everybody is an Apple fan here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I called and I begged the guy who answered the phone. The place was already closed, but it was a technician, a tech repair guy. Would he let me in and would he save my chapter? And so um, he lets me into the store, I go in. Half an hour later, the computer is barfed all over the counter at, the, at Computer Forum in Doylestown. Now he's got it under control, he's doing a beautiful job, I'm not too nervous, it's all going fine. And he looks up and he says very sociably to me, you know, I'm sort of pacing around and he says, so what's your book about? <laughs> And I said, I still haven't learned, I said, evolution. And there's this awful silence again. And he says, well, I can tell you that I have a PhD in engineering. And I know that this earth was created, much as we see it now, within the last five or 6,000 years. So we just sort of look at each other. And I looked down at the computer, barfed out on the counter. And out of wonderful charity in his heart, he just shrugs and he goes back to work and he saves the, ch the draft and I printed it out. And the poor guy, I've told this story 12 zillion times <laughs> since then and um, I'm sure he's heard it himself <laughs> once or twice. It was a very, very merciful act on his part. We agreed to disagree and he saved the chapter. All right, so what is it that uh, makes the Grant study in the Galapagos so extraordinary? It's partly, I think, that Darwin himself didn't believe that you could see what they in fact can see, much as he intuited the importance of the islands. Uh, if you read The Voyage of the Beagle, which is terrific reading, it was a bestseller in his day. It was always his favorite book, by the way, much more important to him than The Origin because it was his first and it was a bestseller. He, uh, he <laughs> says of the Galapagos, hence both in space and time we seem to be brought somewhat near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. 